Okay, I think the title today was Common Sleep Disorders, two of the ones that most people ask about are obstructive sleep apnea, which is by far and away the one that I hear the most about. And then they asked me to briefly mention something about insomnia, so uh, we'll do both of those. Um, I went to school during the uh, slide rule age. We, no calc we didn't even have calculators. I mean, what wouldn't slide rule. And one of the pet peeves that I get or I drive down the road, and then they run me off the road or turn. So I have the old folks version of uh, retribution for the textures. At any rate. So the next time the texture drives you nuts, there's another thought process that you could uh, potentially use there. Ah, I think we're stuck. There we go. First thing we're going to talk about is obstructive sleep apnea, and that's characterized by repetitive episodes of upper airway obstruction. So what's that mean is the air cannot get from your mouth down into your lungs. And when this happens, it blocks the air coming in, which blocks the oxygen coming in, so your oxygen level is going to fall. Sleep often affected my work when I had to travel out of town. Uh, any drive over an hour and a half was so monotonous that I would start to get drowsy, and I would have to pull off and take a nap for 10 or 15 minutes, and then I'd be fine. I would say anywhere from four to six times during the day, I would get drowsy, and if I wanted to, I could go to sleep immediately. That was the amazing thing. Nobody could understand how quickly I could go to sleep at any time of day or night. Sleep apnea means that I would stop breathing for as long as a minute or more during the night. When I get up for air, it would disrupt my sleep. So that's a typical story that we hear. And uh, many times the uh, wives are the ones that actually uh, get us uh, notified that we have this problem. And they usually notify that you're not breathing. And so if they tolerate the snoring and are still in the same room with you, uh, they don't like that not breathing, so you get the old uh, jug, you know, and that wakes you up and you start breathing again. Interestingly enough, uh, this is predominantly a male disorder. Uh, females do have it, but uh, most of the time this is a, a male disorder, and uh, most of my patients, in fact, were male. And that's the difference. Uh, these abbreviations stand for apnea, hypopnea, index. They're common sleep lab terminology. And it's how many times do you either breathe very, very shallow or not breathe at all during an hour. So the higher that number, the more severe your disease would be. And many patients have a indexes around 100. So, I mean, it's not at all unusual to have a very high index, and many of those are associated with very low oxygen concentrations. And the uh, <clears throat> higher that index is, the more likely you are to have significant uh, symptoms with that. So the symptoms that you're going to see are this excessive sleepiness, and we call it EDS, or excessive daytime sleepiness, or excessive daytime somnolence. And generally, in a room like this with this many people, you know, 10, 15 percent will be asleep at least once or twice while we're talking. That's not at all unusual. And I uh, used to take offense at that, but you know, 
as you get older, it doesn't bother you anymore. So. I think we forgot. Is that what happened? That's some cognitive impairment. I don't know. And anyway, the other thing you get is a loud snoring, and that video uh, portrayed that quite well. These apneic episodes, that's actually where you quit breathing. And those episodes can last anywhere from 20 seconds to two or three minutes. And the longer they last, the more likely your oxygen level is to go down and the further it is likely to drop. So that's actually the bad part is the apnea and when your oxygen level actually falls. We uh, have noted that this comes associated with some medical conditions, which uh, we'll talk about in a minute. And then, of course, you get the choking and the gasping, and that's all associated with the loud snoring. And if your wife hadn't thrown you out, certainly the deer camp buddy or your fishing camp buddy's going to. So at our camp, we have the downstairs room, and, uh, you know, if you snore too much, you get to sleep down there with everybody else that snores. <clears throat> and uh, I'm downstairs just in case anybody interested. We have several CPAP machines going down there. In fact, we bought an extra one just to leave it in case somebody forgot theirs. <laughs> so, uh, at any rate, the other thing that you see a lot of times is you, a lot of these patients have to get up and go to the bathroom. And anytime you're not sleeping well, that's associated with not feeling well the next morning. So being fatigued or not up to snuff for the following day is not at all unusual. And the reason, again, is, is when you go to sleep and you have these apnea spells, your oxygen level goes down. When your oxygen level goes down, you actually finally wake yourself up because it gets so low you're suffocating to death. And even though you don't wake up enough to realize you woke up, you wake up enough to disturb your sleep architecture. So even though you've slept all night, you hadn't really slept very well. So you feel very tired and very sleepy the next day. What are the dangers of this? This is the number one thing that I see now. Like I said, I mentioned that I'm the medical director of critical care. We get a lot of automobile accidents in there. And believe it or not, not an inconsequential number of them are associated with people that literally fell asleep, ran off the road, ran into somebody else. And obviously work-related accidents, if you're in some place that uh, matters whether you're awake or not, your boss probably thinks it matters, but certainly if you're operating equipment or something, it might matter. And then for the uh, younger people that are still in school, it can be a definite detriment if you can't stay awake to listen to the lectures can also cause marital problems. You notice a lady turning over and getting a disgusted look on her face. And then certainly you can get memory and concentration difficulties. Did they talk about that next door? No? Tell them to add it to their slide next time. It would be good for them. Um, and then certainly can cause depression. And the motor vehicular crashes, I, I actually want to touch on that just a minute. Last year, 11 deaths caused by drowsy drivers. The 
Look at that. It's not. It's killed when the driver of this van tumbles right off the highway. It happens to drivers of all ages, on the job and off. Studies show sleeping drivers cause at least 100,000 accidents a year. And the number may be three to four times that. No one really knows. So, if you have sleep apnea and you have excessive daytime somnolence, whatever treatment you decide to get, get enough so that if you're going to drive that you can actually stay awake, because this really is a significant issue. Ah. The uh, interesting statistics is if you have sleep apnea, 21% of the patients with the sleep apnea actually have a motor vehicular accident, which they are at fault with. If you take a population that doesn't have sleep apnea, 3%. So there is a huge risk for doing that. So again, if you have it, be sure and get that treated. And then the other one is, is uh, at least 31% of the patients have at least one accident. The other thing that I'll just mention, does anybody have a CPAP machine in here? Yeah, several. The newer machines, and I don't know whether you got one of the newer ones or not, actually have computer cards in them. And the computer cards can tell the doctor, the police, the jury, or whoever else, were you in fact wearing your machine? And they know how long you wore it and how many days and all of that. So throw that out there. Uh, predisposing factors, we're sitting here. Some of us are a little younger and <clears throat> some of us are a little bit older. Some of us are a little overweight, maybe a lot. Some of us aren't. You don't have to be overweight to have this disease. Uh, most of us in here are male. It's at least two to one. In my practice, it was probably six to one. Uh, you can get it if you have certain anatomical abnormalities. That's not a very common problem. The good news is if you have that, that can be fixed. But you can tell by looking at somebody they don't look right. So the plastic surgeons or maxillofacial surgeons can fix that. There are medications that uh, cause this to be worse. Anything that is a sedative will make it worse. That would include the sedating and a uh, histamine such as Benadryl, it's a very popular over-the-counter drug, essentially all of the sleeping pills, some of the antidepressants. And last and certainly not least is uh, alcohol. Alcohol uh, makes it worse. It, not only does it make it worse, it disrupts your sleep architecture. And believe it or not, even though you can drink enough to pass out and go to sleep, it's not good for your sleep. And then the last thing that's on there is actually cigarette smoking. It has several bad traits. And uh, I actually, for a long time, made my living off of cigarettes. I'm a pulmonologist by trade, which is a lung doctor for those of you who don't know. But cigarettes actually, when you smoke them, put carbon monoxide into your system. And if you smoke pack, pack and a half, two packs, it's a lot of carbon monoxide in your system, 10, 15 percent. The carbon monoxide takes the oxygen off of your red blood cells and replaces it with something your body can't use. And then when you get sleep apnea and quit breathing and your oxygen levels dive in already, you're not starting up here, you're starting down here. So that's when you get the heart attack, the stroke, and stuff like that. So if you have sleep apnea, is another good reason to not smoke. And obviously, anybody that's got a family history, you'd want to think about. So if you've got a brother or sister, they are at risk if you have it. What are the medical uh, consequences? Hypertension, anybody get their blood pressure checked today? Should take that opportunity. I think it's out there. Low blood pressure. The ones that we see most frequently are heart attacks and arrhythmias or the irregular heartbeats. These happen very frequently at night in the uh, sleep lab, and we see those pretty, uh, pretty often. The other thing that comes up are strokes and heart failure. And if you have heart failure, that dive in your oxygen capacity at night is not good. It can actually give you pulmonary hypertension, which makes the heart work harder. 
and actually makes that disease worse too. And last but not least is a sudden death. This is where you don't wake up in the morning. And when your wife punches you, you don't roll over anymore. Okay. All right, if this is just a slide that shows if you snore, what is your risk of having morbidity, which is medical complications, or mortality, which is not being here anymore, death. So if you are a heavy snorer or your wife tells you you're a heavy snorer, at least mention this to your doctor when you see him. They may decide it's nothing, but it's a, certainly a sign that you should not ignore. And it's just like you'd go in and I got a headache or my stomach hurts. Snoring is a symptom that can be serious that your physician needs to know about. All the physicians now are familiar with sleep apnea and can get you sent to the right place. 33% of the patients with uh, obstructive sleep apnea have hypertension. So your doctor will be thinking, well, he snores pretty loud, and then all of a sudden you got high blood pressure, and now you can think, well, maybe we ought to do an Epworth sleepiness scale. I passed some of those out. If you want to take one, you can do it yourself. Give it to your doctor. And then 30% of the patients that have hypertension actually have obstructive sleep apnea. So we actually look for that. <clears throat> now this is what I think is the real issue is this low oxygen level. Your oxygen level ought to be 90%, okay? And if it's not, it means you're not delivering enough oxygen to your brain or your heart. And that can have undesirable uh, consequences if your oxygen level drops into this 60 to 69% level, 36% of those patients will have an arrhythmia during their sleep study. I mean, we can measure. It means your heart gets out of sync. And if it hits on the wrong beat, that can result in the sudden death that we talked about, which, again, is not a desirable thing. And if you happen to have 60% or less, you got a 50-50 chance of having an arrhythmia when you go to sleep. So again, this is an illness that if it's severe enough, it does need to be treated. It does need to be followed. That's the reason those computer cards are in those machines. So your doctor or your sleep specialist can check and make sure that we've alleviated this problem. And unfortunately, I'll say this about the machines. They're not pleasant to wear. I don't know of anybody that likes them. But they don't cure anything. They treat it. If you got diabetes and you take insulin, that'll keep your sugar under control. You quit taking your insulin, you're going to come see me in the intensive care unit because your sugar's going to get up and you're going to get sick. It's the same thing with your CPAP machine. You don't have to wear it, but it will come back and get you later. So, unfortunately, you got to wear it. This is a sleep study that we did. And I want you to notice in just a second, he's going to quit breathing, like about now. now the vo video is actually still going. So it's not that the video quit. Now he's going to start trying to breathe. You watch his stomach move a little bit, but he's not moving any air. And he's going to struggle a little bit more, and then he's going to start struggling a lot. And then all of a sudden he's going to get this gasp of air in there. It takes a while. You notice he hadn't taken a breath in a while now. This is, again, not good for you. There's the first breath that he gets right there. That was right at a minute if you wanted to time it. And he'll do this, I think this person, a hundred times in an hour. I mean, it's not at all unusual to have, uh, have it done a lot. And this really just keeps going that he that he doesn't breathe. The next video that I've got, we actually, in the, actually the same patient, we dropped a fiber optic bronchoscope. It's a video camera that I can put down inside your lung or your voice box or wherever. And we literally just took a picture of what's happening. And when it first starts, it's going to be, you're not going to see anything but sort of pinkish tissue. And that pinkest tissue is where the airways totally shut off, and there really isn't any sound other than people wandering around in the background. 
And then once he gets to the point where his oxygen level gets really low, his brain will wake him up and he's going to take a breath. And at that point in time, that'll open up and there's just a dark hole down in there that you'll get to see. And that's the airway opening back up. And that's actually what's happening to everybody that has sleep apnea. Their airway is literally shutting off. would be no different if somebody came and just choked your airways off. And then about the time they thought you were going to die, they let it back open again. Except it happens multiple times during the day. Well, actually during the night. This is the airway supposed to be open. Again, no sound. It's totally blocked off. Some doctors talking there in the background doesn't make for a good video. I got to put music on here next time. Curtis, can you get me some music? It's going to open up here in just a second. Just maybe a little bit, but you still don't hear any movement here. There he goes. Now, there it is. It opened up. And that's the air going down in the hole down there. And then what's making all the wonderful sound, in just a second, you'll see some mucus come across here. That's sputum. People have other names for it. It's not real pleasant. But uh, uh, He's open. He's breathing normally. Not a whole lot of noise going on. But in just a second, it's going to close back off again. And then we'll start over there with the mucus through there. And that snoring's being made by that mucus. It's like a rubber band, and it's vibrating back and forth across. The, when the airway's totally shut, there's no sound at all. But you can see people struggling to try and breathe. In addition to having heart attacks, uh, you can also get strokes. And again, the likelihood of this happening if you have heavy snoring or... Uh, uh, sleep apnea is higher than if you don't. What, there's really two issues, and but most lay people consider them the same. There's a stroke, which is where the blood supply gets cut off by blockage in the blood supply to your brain. That's typical. We see that pretty regular. The other one is actually a bleed into the head where the blood vessel actually breaks and lets the blood get out into the head. That one's more difficult to treat. We actually see that quite a bit also. All right, there's really three different methods that we've got to try and help with this. The first one is the simple part, which in general doesn't work too well. Come on in. We got a chair or two around here. And the uh, first one is obviously to try and attain an ideal body weight. Uh, I think that's excellent advice, very difficult to follow for some people. It doesn't necessarily guarantee that your sleep apnea is going to go away. The second thing is to sleep on your side. If you go to a sleep lab and they do a sleep study, they'll actually break down when you have the apneas and what position you were in. So it may be that all of your apneas occur when you're on your back. Well, if that's the case, you know you need to sleep on your side. Now, I've seen some very inventive ideas on how to get you to sleep on your side. Everything from the wife with one of those little cat prod deals there. It's sticky every time you turn over, so it makes that tough. Uh, the other one, actually, which is pretty simple, is uh, to have somebody that can sew, put some tennis balls in a pajama top, put it down the back, and when you roll, you're going to hit those, and you'll actually turn back over without your wife having to juke you. The next thing is to avoid the sedative medications, in particular that's antihistamines that you see all the time, and uh, the nerve pills. So if you're going to go see your family doctor and you're nervous or anxious and you're trying to get a nerve pill, be sure and mention to him that, oh doc, I got sleep apnea too, so they'll know to be careful with what they're uh, prescribing. Avoid being sleep deprived. Uh, Patients that have sleep apnea are already sleep deprived. So certainly don't do things such as staying up all night playing computer games or going partying at the casino all night and then trying to go to work the next day. The other one that's actually pretty handy is elevate the head of the bed. It may not work too well if your wife's still sleeping with you if she's already moved to the front of the house or a different house. 
uh, you can elevate the head of your bed. And the easiest way to do that actually is to get some blocks. You can go to Home Depot or Lowe's or something and get like a six by six and have them whack a piece off about this big and put one under each leg on the head of your bed and it'll raise it six inches. It's pretty cheap to do that. And uh, cinder blocks work just as well, but they're a little bit bigger and they won't go under the bed sheets and all that other kind of good stuff. So. Uh, ah, what happened? Uh, the last one is uh, avoiding alcohol. Uh, alcohol is not good for sleep apnea. It's not good for insomnia, and it's not good for uh, probably much of anything, but I sure do know a lot of people that like to drink it, including myself. <laughs> so. so at any rate, uh, you're not supposed to do that, but let's try moderation and, uh, you know, one or two drinks instead of... Uh, getting totally smashed. The other thing that I think is very important, and again, this is where your family physician can help you, is if you get a cold, that's swelling the airway shut so that, uh, you know, you're already compromising an area that's compromised, so it's going to make it worse. So don't sit on top of a cold. You've got to go ahead and get that treated. Medical treatment. We have weight loss, which we talked about a little bit. Pharmacological, right now we're not there. You would need a drug that would keep the airway from collapsing. Now, we can Botox it and keep it from doing that. The problem is, is it works all the time. It doesn't work part of the time, so it's going to be ineffective when you're awake. So it's not going to work. <coughs> Oxygen therapy is actually something that we do pretty regular. If some of you have the CPAP machine, you may have oxygen bled into the CPAP machine to keep your oxygen level from going down. That's what we check at the sleep lab. We want to be sure that your oxygen level is not falling while you're sleeping. The nasopharyngeal intubation, uh, that actually works very well. I've not seen anybody really able to do it very many times. In fact, you've got to be pretty tough to do it once, but you take a small garden hose, cut it off about this long, you grease it up with some Vaseline, and you stick it in your nose till it gets down to about here. And actually, we have a medical one that looks prettier than a garden hose, but it's about the same size, and if you don't get it big enough, it doesn't work. So if anybody wants to do that more than once, I'll certainly be happy to add that I have seen one person that would do that, but I don't think so. The uh, nasal CPAP and BiPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, the BiPAP actually uh, changes pressure depending on whether you're breathing in or breathing out. This is, in fact, the treatment that 95 plus percent of all patients have, still the gold standard. And unfortunately for the foreseeable future, I think it will remain the gold standard. Uh, there are all kinds of machines out there now. It used to be only one kind. The new ones have the computer chips. The new ones are actually don't put any pressure on you while you're awake, and then when you go to sleep, they'll slowly raise the pressure up. And the brand new ones actually sense when you're having an apnea spell and automatically adjust the pressure to fit whatever kind of apnea spell you're having. Uh, None of them are any more effective than the others. They are just more comfortable. What that means is, is your insurance company is going to buy you the cheap one. And they're not going to buy you the more expensive one, unless you've got some really good insurance, which I hadn't seen too much of. So those machines are available. If you can afford the better one, it is a lot easier to wear. That's bottom line. What is affordable and all insurance companies will get you is the mass that goes on the end of that machine come in multiple kinds and multiple configurations. Probably 40 or 50 different masks out there right now. Be sure and get one that fits you and feels good because that will make a lot of difference. You've got to wear this thing every single night for like ever. So I highly recommend getting a... Uh, mass that fits. The automatic CPAP I alluded to a minute ago, it'll not put any pressure on you unless it feels like 
you're having an apnea spill and then it'll turn it on and give you the pressure. Oral appliances, uh, there are some dentists that can make uh, devices that fit in your mouth and it basically holds your jaw forward and keeps the airway open. Uh, sometimes that will work, uh, so it is something that you could consider. The worse your apnea is, the less likely it is to work, but it still can work. If you decide to go that route, what you have to do is you have to get yourself checked with the sleep study again after you've got the device in place. The reason I think the CPAPs work so well is once you go to the sleep lab and they decide you need it, they put that CPAP on you while you're asleep and they adjust it. So when you leave, they know that it's working. There's no question that it's working or not. The oral appliances, don't you know, you can order it over the internet, you go to the dentist, get it. You have no clue whether that's working or not, none whatsoever. Your wife can probably tell you whether you're snoring or not, but uh, you don't know whether it's actually letting your uh, oxygen level go. The surgical treatment, the bad news about the surgical treatment is it only works about half the time. So it is possible, in fact, 50-50, that you can go have the surgery done and not get any benefit whatsoever and have to come back and still wear your CPAP machine. So. Uh, if that's the case, then why not just wear it in the first place? So I've, I've never been a real big com proponent of surgery. I would prefer for it to work like 90% of the time or something that would make me feel like I got a better chance with it. But if you hate your CPAP machine enough and you want to try it, it is out there and they can do it. All of these are the different types of procedures that they do. The most common one is a uvulopalatopharyngoplasty. And uh, they cut the uvula, which is a little hangy down thing in the back of your throat off. They carve up the arch of your soft palate. Sometimes they whack a piece of your tongue off and they make that opening a little bit bigger. And uh, you know, if it works, that's great. There is one surgery that always works. And this one, I can tell you, it's 100%. That's a tracheostomy. And I don't think there's a single person in this room that wants one of those. But what that is, is we cut a hole in your neck and we just bypass your vocal cords and everything else so that you can breathe when you uh, obstruct your airway. That type of operation is commonly done for patients that have cancer up in that area. So I'm sure if you think about it, you've probably seen some people that have that. But I'd I don't actually recommend that, but it does work. It's on the list. And then the last one is gastroplasty. Any of the weight reduction surgeries that could cause you to lose substantial amounts of weight, get back down to ideal body weight, we're talking like 100 pounds loss, uh, would be worthwhile considering and might actually help. Now, this poor guy actually has uh, restless leg syndrome. So those of you who think you have a problem with sleep apnea, you could do this every night. And uh, he has it severely, but this is literally the whole time that he's asleep. And it's bad. Uh, we see this syndrome a lot in uh, milder degrees. It's where your leg jerks and you don't have any control over that. Uh, but it can get obviously uh, bad. The uh, next thing I think we're going to briefly mention, because I am going to try and stay on time because I never stand between the audience and lunch, I think we're close, is insomnia. Uh, again, the sleep apnea is a disease of too much or excessive sleepiness. Insomnia is not sleepy enough, although during the daytime, if you're an insomniac, you may very well be tired, don't feel well. The interesting thing I think about insomnia is, is I think one of the reasons it's difficult to treat is that all living organisms actually have a biological clock, probably down to the cellular level. If you take a piece of human brain out and put it in tissue culture, it actually has a clock inside there. Our clock happens to rest in the basal ganglia section, which is down in the base of your uh, brain. And 
it's hard to set it. It knows what time it is. And it knows when you're supposed to be awake, and it knows when you're supposed to be asleep. And that comes from a long time. The scientist actually discovered this uh, was an astronomer, and he discovered it in plants. So anyhow, these clocks actually are inside everybody, and uh, they control when your hormones are released, when you digest your food, when you feel awake, when you feel sleepy. And, you know, we've got some drugs that are trying to readjust that, but it's, it's actually not an easy thing to do. People with insomnia actually, by definition, have impaired daytime function. They either can't go to sleep, they can't stay asleep, or they wake up multiple times during the night. And you can have any number of those. And the key on this one is this occurs despite having adequate time. So it's not the college kid who elects to go to class all day, or maybe not, and then goes party all night, and then comes home, plays computer games, and then the next morning, you know, he didn't get much sleep, maybe slept through class. But he had the uh, he he could have gone to sleep. So we don't consider that an illness. That's a choice. There's really two types of insomnia. There's the insomnias with the short duration, and the most common one that I see is what we call the acute insomnias. And the best example I can think of is your wife has had a stroke and is in the intensive care unit at the hospital and you're staying in the uh, room and staying with her day and night, maybe a little relief here and there, and you know, all of a sudden you can't go to sleep anymore because you're worried about it, even if you go home. And that type of thing will pass uh, after whatever the event that incites it passes. The other one that we see a lot is the circadian rhythm disorders. Those Plant workers can get into real easy seven on, seven off, night shift, evening shift. And then the other one uh, are the jet lags. Those are people that have to fly around the country and they uh, cross multiple time zones. And in their time zone, it's 9 o'clock in the morning, but the time zone they're in, it's 9 o'clock at night. And the shift work we already mentioned, High altitude insomnia is not really a big problem in Baton Rouge. <laughs> so, well, no, not too much. I think, what, 33, 35 feet, I think, is a, unless you get in a really tall building. Uh, insomnias with the longer durations or inadequate sleep hygiene, the idiopathic, and the ones that are associated with other conditions, medical conditions, very common. You've had back surgery, hip surgery, whatever, and you can't go to sleep because it hurts or you can't get comfortable. Uh, many of the psychiatric disorders, depression, uh, and some other ones can be associated with that. And certainly on nearly all of the neurologic diseases, some of the strokes can actually affect your clock and you either can't wake up or you can't go to sleep, and those there's almost nothing we can do about because the clock doesn't work anymore. And then the big another big one is multiple medications affect uh, affect your sleep architecture, and that's very very common issue. 
and different patients respond differently to that. And then I think our next one, I think, is my parking slide. Anybody get here after 8 o'clock? Oh, man, I was late. Okay. I mean, I had a little trouble finding a parking place. I, I think I'm somewhere over in the boondocks out there with the jackrabbits. And uh, I found a guy that actually is pretty good at locating parking places. Let's see if I got it. Whoop, there's the sleep disorders. Yeah, come on. Yeah, here we go. So. So if anybody can tell me how to do that in my pickup truck, that would be a good, uh, good thing. So, um, at any rate, uh, that concludes what I officially have to say. I'd be happy to uh, entertain some questions.